Hi, I'm Wes. Happy Independence Day and welcome to Wes B. On July 15th, we'll be hosting local businesses and agencies to bless over 100 kids and their families that need a little extra help. We'll be sharing resources and the gospel with families that day. We need your help to make this day a success. To volunteer for this special day, please stop by the welcome desk this Sunday or sign up at hope.westby.org. Mark your calendars. Summer Suppers is taking a break this Wednesday, July 5th, but will return next Wednesday, July 12th at 6.15 p.m. Windshape Camp starts tomorrow. All completed kindergarten through fifth graders are invited to join in on the fun July 3rd through the 7th for the best week ever. Go to windshapecamps.org for more information and to register. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I know you know this, and if you don't, you need to look up our nation's Declaration of Independence. It was adopted by the Second Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776. This is why we celebrate Independence Day. So here, the founders, they met in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and they declared that the 13 colonies in the United States were sovereign states. We broke from England, and ultimately it escalated into war, which we know as the Revolutionary War. Now, this second sentence, the preamble following the introduction, is an important statement on human rights. Government should promote policies that benefit everyone equally. We haven't always done that in our nation, but that's how we were founded, with that idea. Government does not choose which religion is right or good, but rather protects the free market of religious liberty. Psalm 33, 12. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. If God can save any person, he can save any church, and he can save any nation. Governments operate best when God is in and not out. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 15. A passage from the Old Testament, but one that certainly applies to what we're talking about today. 2 Chronicles 15, look at verse 3. I'll read through verse 6 here. For a long time Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach them, without, and without the law to instruct them. But whenever they were in trouble and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him out, they found him. During those times it was not safe to travel. Problems troubled the people of every land. Nation fought against nation and city against city, for God was troubling them with every kind of problem. Okay, this passage describes a dark time in which no nation was seeking God. And then God brought them trouble, for God was troubling them with every kind of problem, it says. Now that passage is, is challenging, and you may be thinking, well, what do you mean God was troubling them? Well, he was trying to get their attention. I mean, let's think about this. If God is your problem, then only God can be your solution. So he was acting as their problem so that they would look to him as, as their solution. He troubles us to turn us back to himself. I love what Tony Evans says. He says, the closer God is to a society, the more ordered the society will be. The further God is, the more chaotic society will be. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, Moses writes, But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Garden of Eden. God was the government in the Garden of Eden. And he gave humanity maximum freedom. Did you pick up on that? They could do whatever they wanted, just not this one tree. God gave them, God gave humanity, Adam and Eve, maximum freedom and limited regulation. There's only one tree you can't have, but this regulation came with dire consequences for not obeying. What should we realistically expect 
out of our government. And I think a realistic expectation, really of any government, but since we're talking about uh, our nation's independence, let me just speak for the United States, I, I think a reasonable expectation for us is that our government would maintain a safe and just environment for freedom to flourish. And I think this is rooted biblically. Look at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of authorities? Do what is right. They will honor you. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those to, who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government, workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Okay, very basic passage there. I mean, I mean, the scripture also assuming that the government is acting at least in a half, halfway noble way, of course. I mean, if we're forced to either obey the government or, you know, break God's law, well, we don't, we don't break God's law. What the Bible teaches, though, is that God, government was never intended to keep God out. And even if government pushes God away, he's still in control. I mean, that's what Romans 13 teaches. God's governing principles will prevail regardless of what systems we set up. And all political systems will fail in the long run. But God's kingdom will last for all eternity. Now, we're going to be doing a whole series on religious liberty following this series in Revelation. So I give you this just as a bit of a, a preview because, uh, well, one, we're going to be talking about it here in a few weeks, but two, um, it's, you know, Independence Day at the time that this is airing. It's Independence Day week, um, and I do believe that there are biblical principles that apply to the founding of our nation and uh, this idea of independence. But since we're in the book of Revelation and we're walking through this series, I at least want to answer a question. Where is America in Revelation? Is the United States in the book of Revelation? No. Now that doesn't mean the sermon's over, but I want to walk through this. The United States is not explicitly mentioned in the Bible. Um, it's, it's likely um, that none of the prophecies in the Bible really refer to the U.S. Well, why not? Well, there's only two nations explicitly mentioned in Revelation. Israel, or the nations, and that represents God's people. So there's this symbol of Israel and this symbol of, hey, these, these are people in the kingdom. And then Babylon, which represents Satan's evil kingdom. So Revelation sets up this either-or uh, paradigm where either you're in God's kingdom or out. Either you're part of the people of God or you're part of Babylon. Now, you get some passages like in Revelation 12, which we'll get there here in a few weeks, talks about the great eagle, some think that maybe this is the United States. I really don't think that it is, um, nor do I believe that the United States is the second beast in Revelation 13, some, some kind of point to that. Uh, you know, I, I, those theories and interpretations are not necessarily anti-biblical. I just don't quite see the—I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that. Um, some believe that the United States will be so weak during the end times that our nation really plays no role. That's potentially true. Others speculate the United States ceases to exist during the end of days. I guess that's possible. Most likely, the U.S. is included in those passages that talk about all the nations. And all the prophecies, for the most part in Revelation, speak to all the nations. Now remember last week, Revelation 10, verse 11. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The goal is for people from all over the world to enter the kingdom of God. The angel 
commands John to consume the scroll. And if you didn't get a chance to hear that message, to go watch that video from last week. The angel commands John to consume the scroll, and the, this language of consuming a, sc a scroll or God's Word is found in other places in the Bible. The meaning is very simple, that we are to deeply internalize God's Word. It's become part of who we are. But this message is bittersweet. It's salvation to those who accept God's Word. It's honey in the mouth. It's judgment for those who reject God's Word. It presents a sour stomach. What happens in our nation is important, very important. We should care. But your place as a believer in Jesus Christ, your place in God's kingdom is what matters the most. You know, I love the national anthem at uh, Tampa Bay Rays games. Uh, uh, most of the church members at West Bradenton know I, I'm a pretty big baseball fan. I go to a lot of baseball games, just something I enjoy doing. Enjoy taking my kids, my wife. It's a good date night. She enjoys it too. So. Um, and I realize, so I love the national anthem. I like to get there early and I like to experience the national anthem at a baseball game. And I realize what I'm about to say, not everyone will share my views on the Star Spangled Banner. That's okay, but this is just, this is how I feel. So let me share my heart. When we're all standing up singing together, you know, our hats are off, we're focused on the flag. You know, everyone is showing respect for the place where we all live. We're honoring those who have sacrificed so that we can live in freedom. And, and in that moment, in my mind, it's unity and diversity. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is. All these people around me, I have no idea. For the most part, I have no idea who they are. I don't even, I don't even know what they believe. But we're all there unified in it together. And I, you know, <laughs> I really don't care where you're coming from so long as you're not cheering for the Yankees. That's the point, right? We're all in this together as Rays fans. Certainly, at a ballpark full of people, there's plenty of examples of places where I would disagree with lifestyles and you know, how, you know, some of the choices people make, of course. But in that moment, we're all together. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. It's been on the U.S. seal since the 1780s. The first coin was, with the phrase was struck in 1786. In fact, since 1786, it's kind of been the de facto motto for the United States. Although we did adopt the official motto of In God We Trust in 1956. Now, the original meaning of E Pluribus Unum was out of many states or out of many colonies emerge one nation. But I think there's also a secondary meaning here that's important. Out of many peoples, out of many ethnicities, out of many backgrounds, uh, you know, all of, we all emerge as one nation. And this idea of e pluribus unum is, the concept is an imperfect reflection of what occurs in Revelation. Revelation shows us how this happens in the kingdom of God. Revelation 7, 9. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. You should love your country. I hope you do. But your greatest desire should be to enlarge the kingdom of God. Why are you here? Why do you exist? Why did God create you? You have a divine design straight from God. And it's to give God, what, what, what is your purpose? It's to give God glory and it's to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That he died for everyone's sins, that anyone who wants to be saved from their sins can be. That happens, your salvation happens through the grace of Jesus Christ because he died on the cross, shed his blood for your sins and rose again to give you life. He ascended into heaven to show that he is God, ruling and reigning forever. This is the gospel. Not everyone will believe it, but everyone should have the opportunity to. Mark chapter 1, 14 through 15. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God. It's not a political kingdom. And it's even more than just kind of what's in our hearts. You know, when, when is this kingdom established? Well. God's kingdom is a future reality. We're talking about that in the book of Revelation, but it's also already here. So the best way to think of the kingdom of God is already here, but not yet completed. Jesus secured victory on the cross, yet we still have a few more battles to fight. And we live 
in the already, but the not yet. And the kingdom is made up of the church, Christ's body. And the kingdom of God gives you purpose today and also purpose in eternity. Matthew 6, verse 33, seek the kingdom of, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Perhaps you memorized the New American Standard Version. Seek first his kingdom. How often do parents say to children or a boss says to an employee or a teacher says to a student, why didn't you come to me first? There was some issue, there was some problem, and someone tried to solve it on their own and they ended up creating more problems and making things worse. What God is telling us here, seek first the kingdom of God, what God is telling us is come to me first. Our nation's declaration of independence begins with an idea, a very important idea, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone. I believe firmly in what our founders wrote, where are these things ultimately found, though? There is no life apart from Jesus Christ. There is no liberty except for what is found in God's word. And happiness, well, we'll only really know that, at least pure joy, on the other side of eternity. So, live today for what will matter then. Live today for eternity. Live for Jesus and his kingdom.